Guys, Zubin, Dr. Marty McCary. Great to be with you. Back again. Marty's a hot shot. Wrote a book, came out on paper book. Paper book? <laughs> This is a it's paperback. Great. Good start. Yeah, yo, I keeps it real. Uh, the price we pay, um, what broke American healthcare and how to fix it. And I had you on like two years ago when the thing came out in hardcover. That was fun. I've watched it like five times. Dude, just to, yeah. I have it on repeat too. Like when I'm rolling with my kids, I'm like, let's listen to basically how angry you can get. <laughs> um, understanding how we've financially assaulted patients who are in fact us. <laughs> I no longer go and buy Ben and Jerry's when I had a rough day at work to engage in emotional eating, I now just watch our videos. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the there's, there's a whole branch of therapy devoted to that, Marty. <laughs> I, I am I am proud to be here. Great to see you again, Zubin. By the way, my preferred pronouns are member of the Z-Pack, Z-Dog MD tribe. That's the only pronouns that I will allow my children to list <laughs> uh, on their Zoom for school. Um, dude, so... <laughs> Speaking of pronouns, there's a lot of pronouns in here. You tell stories of people, and the fact that it's in paperback means that the ZPAC needs to go buy this book on paperback like today that it's out um, so that we can rocket it to the New York Times bestseller list. And the reason that matters is that that will give it a viral boost. And the reason that matters is in this book, when I first read it, and it's been updated now, and now it's got like post-COVID stuff. It's got like some some things that happened since the book came out. It's it a good follow-up. It really is. It led to this activism where doctors and patients actually made a difference. Like this intractable system that no one can fix, it's starting to shift because you put, first sunlight's the best disinfectant. You shine a light on everything that, like patients get these ridiculous surprise bills. They then go bankrupt when a hospital system that whose motto is doing the Lord's work, like it may be a not-for-profit like Catholic group is suing their own patients, yeah. throwing them into bankruptcy. It's nuts. I mean, we, we can do stuff and st good stuff is happening. And I'm, I'm proud to report since we first did that conversation on, the, on this topic. We are shutting down this practice of predatory billing in America. And, I, and when I say we, it is n not really not me. It is the giant group of people out there mm. that read the book, that have heard our stuff, that have seen our paper in JAMA, and have said, this isn't right. It's violating the great public trust in the medical profession. We're offended by it. We should be offended by it. You know, 64% of Americans say they have avoided or delayed care for fear of the bill. Mm. It's affecting access. And these are things we can prevent. We've lost control of billing as, you know, healthcare clinicians. But these are our institutions engaging in price gouging and predatory billing. And we have a say. If we are aware of it, we can have a say. And good stuff is happening. We've asked a lot of hospital CEOs, can you stop the practice of suing people who can't afford to pay your bill? Mm -hmm. And- of the one third of hospitals that do do this stuff, uh, most of them are saying, okay, yeah, I get it. I understand. Now, a couple of them are, are, you know, tough and they won't do anything, but we, you know, that's when we unleash, you know, we get other people to call. We talk to the doctors and say, hey, you know, this is, these are your patients. And we, um, you know, one time resorted to calling the donors of oh. a hospital <laughs> and that shut it down. Oh, that man. shut it down at UVA. <laughs> Oh, UVA, that's yeah. what you did. So this this is the thing. In the book, you wrote about how like, okay, you, you know, patients will get these inflated charge master bills. And in the book, you detail the money games that hospitals have to play in order to get reimbursed by insurance. It's this lack, it's completely opaque world of subterfuge where it's like, if I bill the insurance this ridiculously inflated rate, they'll pay this much of it. So let's keep racking up those prices, the rack rate. And then what happens is when their patient comes, it's uninsured or worse, underinsured. They have insurance, but they have these high deductibles, whatever. High deductibles. They're on the hook for that full charge master. They get sued by the hospital when they can't pay, because of course they can't pay, and they never agreed to that price up front. It's not like they got an estimate at a mechanic for a tire rotation. It was like, no, your appendectomy is now $30,000. Oh, and by the way, no one knew that you could get the same appendectomy down the street for $2,000, Because, but there's no way to shop these prices. So you brought that to light. You said, well, okay, this is what's happening, and then, you didn't stop. You actually went and you went to like courthouses and started. Like, tell me what <laughs> yeah, you did yeah, there. So um, myself and and my friends that are in, in, in this with me, mm -hmm. we have offered to defend any patient who is sued by a medical center pro bono as their expert. We're not lawyers, but we're experts. And when we show up there, 
you can better believe that it's a different court proceeding. When we approach the bench with the patient and say, Your Honor, there's no agreement here. You can't just show up and mow someone's lawn and charge them $5,000. <laughs> there's got to be an agreement. Where's the agreement on the price? Now, many times these people are begging for a price. They just want to know, like, is this going to clean me out? A lot of the stuff is elective. 60% of medical care is shoppable. They, they're they asking us for a price, and our hospitals cannot give it to them. This is the most basic piece of information. And so we win 100% of the time. Wow. We win every freaking case that we go uh, and defend a patient. You're like a Perry Mason MD, my friend. Well, That's we're, we're, we're getting the hospitals to just cancel the practice altogether. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're going to keep winning. Like, how much revenue does it really generate Half for of the CEO salary. That's how much revenue suing all these people generates. And we published that in JAMA. Wow. All of that revenue is about half of the CEO salary. That makes me slightly want to vomit projectile right into the camera. Well, I asked one of the CEOs, do you think you can get by on one million a year? <laughs> I mean, we got to have an honest conversation yeah, about this stuff, oh right? It's price God. gouging is what it is. You said something that's super important. You point this out in the book. Healthcare could be shoppable, but we can't shop because they cannot and will not give you a price. So can I tell a story? So my daughter needed a uh, an MRI uh, done. And I've told this story vaguely before, so I'll leave some of the details out, but let's suffice to say she needed an MRI. I have a high deductible plan, so it's like $6,500 deductible. Wow. Family deductible. Mm -hmm. So I'm on the hook for at least that much, right? So my skin's in the game. Like to me, that's like money I don't necessarily need to spend if it's not necessary. And I will haggle, believe me, because I'm Indian. Like I will haggle. <laughs> and so, and I'm a doctor, so I think, oh, I know what's up, right? So. I go to my usual multi-specialty group that actually you've mentioned before that's part of a larger organization that is known to price gouge. Like they are known to do this. They're known to inflate rates on labs and all of this. And in fact, they were sued by the state of California for this. We'll leave them unnamed. Mm -hmm. So- Yeah, I would never name, I would never name Sutter Health. No, I wouldn't do that either. No. That would be wrong. Yeah. So not naming Sutter Health, we could say that I went to this not unnamed, uh, um, Project. The, the irony is there are great doctors there. That's oh, the, the best. irony. That's right? why I went there. These yeah. are my colleagues. That's where I used to work. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I knew, I was like, okay, this is gonna be an issue. So before I got the MR, my doc, the doctor ordered it, the pediatrician ordered it. Um, she was fantastic. I called s the billing department and I said, hey, this is Dr. Demania. I pulled like the whole doctor thing. And I yeah. said, uh, I said um, I, I'm about to get my kid this thing curious how much it costs so that, and if there's any discounts available or if we pay cash because I have a high deductible plan. You have a coupon for 50% off. Basically, <laughs> that's what I want. Like I have a group on, like me and my friends are all getting MRIs and we were wondering, and, and she said, oh great doc, what's the CPT code for the scan you're getting? And I was like, okay, let's pretend I'm a patient. Cause I don't want, I don't know CPT code. She goes, oh, okay, so what's the scan? And I saw oh, it's this, that, and the other thing. She goes, okay, so she takes some time. She, she was actually very helpful. She took some time. She looked up the CPT code. She said, okay, it's this. All right, our, and I can't promise that this is what it is. Cause they may add things. They may change things. It's going to be 1800 bucks for this MRI. And I was like, Conk. I'm like, all right, okay. No surprise. It's, it's this place. It's going to cost a lot. Yeah. So I said, okay, does that include physician's fees and all that? I, I don't know. Uh, okay. So let me understand then. If I pay cash, what will the discount be? Will I get a discount? She goes, oh yeah, absolutely. We really encourage that. Okay, what's the discount? 30% off. Okay. <laughs> so it's still like 1500 bucks or whatever. Okay, great. Well, let me ask a question. When do I need to make that decision? You need to do it before the procedure and before the insurance is billed. Because once the insurance is billed, we can't give you the cash discount. Okay, so then let me ask the third question. What will the insurance discount be? Because a lot of times insurance companies negotiate discounted rates that they then would say, okay, so you're gonna have, Zubin, you're gonna have to pay this much towards your deductible because the insurance negotiated rate for that MRI was only $1,000, but you're on the hook for the thousand because of the high deductible that you chose. And she said, we can't tell you that because those rates are not disclosed publicly. And I said, oh. Because if they were, they'd have competition. There would be competition. There exactly. would be a free market around There'd those a, discounts. And we know we live in America where we talk about free market medicine, mm -hmm. but this is not the free market. This is obfuscated. So at this point, I have, I said, so you're telling me I need to make a decision now 
uh, with information I don't have about what the insurance discount would be. And by the way, if I make the decision to pay your cash rate, that cash payment that I made to you does not apply towards my deductible. So that if I have incur oh, more medical right, expenses, right. then it's not, I'm gonna have to pay them. So this is very complicated. And look, I did math, I'm a doctor, I couldn't do the math. <laughs> I had calculus three in high school. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot develop a model that's going to figure out whether or not I should pay this cash discount. And what would happen if you didn't ask for a discount? If you didn't ask for a discount, you're just simply not going to get it. You're going to get the rack rate charged to you. And in collections. You, and maybe collections. Maybe it's going to court. go to collections. It's going to go to court. And I'm going to be, you know, medically bankrupt what if a I'm. Joke. It's a joke. What a joke. It's worse it's than a joke. It's embarrassing. It's, 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 it's a disgrace. It's, it's a moral injury the country suffers. Like, uh, we're like the only country. Like, what is this 1800s Victorian England <laughs> where you end up in pauper's prison because, oh, it looks like Billy got an appendix blown out. Well, now he's in pauper's prison because his whole family couldn't pay the bill. And now she sold herself into, you know, white slavery. You're like, wait, wait, yeah. where did this come from? Right. <laughs> How about. We have clear prices. Like people don't go into bankruptcy because their mechanic gave them an estimate in advance and they couldn't pay for the car. It's like they sell the car, they make a decision, right? Imagine you went to a travel website and there were no prices and the airlines argued what hospitals argued. Oh, we don't know the price. We don't know what our true cost is gonna be. The plane could have a delay or a, or a cancellation or it could crash. That would cost us a lot of money. Or even though it's our fault, and it could, you you could consume a beverage. We we can't give you a price, right? No, there are smart people. Arguably, we might have smarter people in in medicine, right? America's University Medical Center. It's supposed arguable. Supposed to be that. It's arguable. Yeah. Supposed to be the bastion of medical scientific genius. They build models of predictable risk and they price it into a shoppable price for that service like the MRI. And you go on the travel website and you look at different prices and you shop. Imagine if you got, if there were no prices, you would get gouged by every airline and the public would hate the airline industry. Mm. Sound familiar? Mm. We are losing the public trust with these money games and it's it's up to us, physicians, nurses, everyone who works in a hospital to say, th these are our services. How dare you gouge somebody and p put them in wage garnishment at the local courthouse. Yeah. And so we're, keep, we're gonna keep fighting, we're gonna keep winning, we're gonna shut it down. Okay, so you do, you do that for the courthouses and things like that. You've stopped, like, I mean, I'll, I'll just show this graph. Like, so this is in the update. This is why the, the, the paperback, even if you have the, the hardcover, this is why this is important. There's a whole afterword here about stuff that's happened. Look at this graph, dudes. I feel like um, I feel like Nickelback. <laughs> Look at this here graph. <laughs> Every time I do, it makes me go, wow, Marty. A number of lawsuits, yeah. So, and I showed this on a previous show. So here's like the number of lawsuits before the book. Here's where the, the line, the vertical line is where the book came into being. And this is the number of lawsuits against patients after the book. We're shutting it down. It's going to come out in JAMA, that that graph. Uh, JAMA's probably going to be upset that we, you know, I released it here in the updated book uh, today, but you know, um, you know what, they'll get over it. Yeah. They'll get over it. They can, uh, you know, I understand they're um, really good at handling controversy. Remember the dude who was like, racism isn't a thing. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> I think they might add a third minority member to their editorial board. So JAMA, <laughs> Jim, they have 49 editors. Uh -huh. uh, two of them were, were African American. New England Journal, I don't know why I'm talking about this now. No, it's they important. They have 51 editors at the New England Journal of Freaking Medicine. One African American. Like, doesn't somebody say, hey, you know what? Maybe diversity changes our perspective on what the important issues are. After all, we are the gatekeeper of the entire healthcare system of the world. Maybe we, it would be important to have some diversity, not just race. How about age diversity? Yeah. How about people from different specialties, aka non cardiologists, on the board? <laughs> <laughs> just an idea. I I I love it, dude. I but love it. Anyway, Jamma Jamma's publishing that. Unless they're going to watch this and maybe cancel the. No, publication. in which case, you know, then you're welcome, Marty. You, you just lost the publication. <laughs> I I will say this. So your activism, like again, because we always feel powerless. All you did was incredibly and meticulously research, like like a bulldog, this subject, wrote a book that was a result of years of work, 
and then evangelize it for the last couple of years since this has been happening, and it's changed actual lives. And actually, the, my issue where I was like, how do I even estimate a price here? What do I do? What did you do about that? You went like lobbied Congress and stuff and got something done. Yeah, first of all, we can get stuff done, okay? We in healthcare, even though we're seeing patients at the bedside, we can get stuff done. And seeing patients increases our credibility because we're respected in the community. Mm. Oh, you are. I, they look at me as a rapping clown man. But <laughs> no, yeah. no, I still think <clears throat> the sort of person that goes into nursing school, the sort of person that has many career options and says, I want to be a doctor, that person is different from their peers, mm. and they are highly respected for what they do. You mm. see it every day, right? People trust us to put a knife to their skin within a second of meeting them just because they're at the hospital. And that no, that's me on the street. <laughs> like, honestly, like people come up, I'm like, hey, buddy. Like, can I have your wallet? And the knife is to the skin and he trusts me implicitly. <laughs> um, no, 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 you're absolutely right. But we can get stuff done. So in, uh, we went to the policymakers and, I, and I'll tell you exactly who we went to, even though we might get canceled or what else is this name? will generate some comments. I, we went to Nancy Pelosi and okay. we went to her staff. Okay. We went to Secretary Azar and we went to the CMS uh, administrator, um, Seema Verma. Yeah. They all said, I get it. I get it. This is wrong. We posted videos of the patients because CEOs are like, no, we have liberal financial aid policies. Anybody qualifies. They just don't return our calls. Not true. Listen to the patient stories. Yeah. Okay. One of my students, Michael um, Bachter, is a filmmaker. He's a medical student. He was a filmmaker. Wow. He said, Marty, I want to create videos to share their stories with the world. And we put them up at restoringmedicine.org, and we played those little two-minute video clips of mm. patients telling their story of a predatory and unfair billing system in medicine that shut them out and put them into this sort of pauper's court, mm. garnished their wages from Walmart, and we played that to mm. Nancy Pelosi and the White House and all kinds of folks. And they said, you know what, we're gonna do something. Mm. And so we got the price transparency executive order passed and signed by the president with bipartisan support. Wow. And that also re requires that hospitals create a price estimator. So you put in your insurance information and you figure out what they're gonna pay, what you pay, and what the price of the service is. Mm. Mayo Clinic had done it already. And we said, this is the model, if Mayo can do it, Every hospital can do it. Mm. So it's taking effect. Um, some hospitals are not complying with the law and they're paying the $300 a day fine instead. That's like a, that's like a, a mosquito bite for them though, It's right? nothing, right? Yeah. We can do something. We work for these hospitals. We, we yeah. can create public accountability around this practice. And you, and you have, because now you, know, you, you have this price estimator, which would have helped me dramatically. And you know, and when there's when there's transparent pricing, there's no gouging, right? Because yeah. the, the the you it's the sunlight that disinfects right. price gouging. Yeah, you can make a choice. Actually, uh, heaven forbid. Um, it, it, what's interesting is that they actually, you know, I think everybody agrees this is a problem. So here's a question. This was the follow up. Is it who is and this is tough to because it's such a complex web. Who's ultimately to blame for the obfuscation going on here? Is it the hospitals that don't want to do this? Is it the insurance companies for negotiating these things and like playing these games? I mean, who, who's to what is it? I think we've got good people in healthcare, honestly, but we're working in a, in a bad system, and it's a system that we didn't design. Mm. It's a system we inherited, uh. and it's a broken system. And the games are getting worse because of the trickle down orders from the top line management in hospitals, it's like increased revenue, increased revenue. So it gets outsourced to the CFO who outsources billing to another firm, who outsources it to a third party, who outsources it to a lawyer who's beating people down for these prices and gouging people. Mm. I, think we're, I think we've become disconnected. We've lost control of billing as physicians. Yeah, and, we have nothing to right? do with it now, it's crazy. And we can take it back. Yeah, and and the book really talks about some bright spot ways to do this. I mean, what, what was that? Well, by the way, what was the deal with Henry in the book? <laughs> you had a story; it was really quite powerful. Well, it was similar to your your um, situation where he was told his dad needed a cabbage. Okay, mm -hmm. very standardized procedure in the United States, mm -hmm. and he was told by the hospital it's going to be one hundred and fifty thousand mm. dollars because it was clear that he had means. Mm. Okay, he flew in from. Um, from overseas, and they knew he had means, so they just threw out there 
$150,000 for the cabbage. Mm. He didn't know if that was a reasonable price. He was happy to pay a fair price, but just had no idea. Like, is it normally a million? Is it normally 20,000? They call a family friend in France, mm. and the doctor, who is a cardiac surgeon with great outcomes, well-known, and does the same procedure, says, you know, we do it at our hospital for uh, $15,000. Mm. If you want to have it done here, you can fly in and get it done. That is our hospital price. Mm. If you want to get it done there, that's a good hospital too. I don't know about their pricing. Right. So he then tells the hospital administrator, who's now starting to harass him, like, do you want it done here? We can lock in that price. Oh my God. Like some car dealership. Like a car dealership. And yeah. he says, well, we hear it's $15,000 elsewhere. We might have it done there. And the hospital says, okay, how about $50,000? <laughs> and he was like, I don't know. I don't feel comfortable with this. And the guy goes, okay, what did you hear? What was the other price? 15000 25000 if oh, you pay in cash. My God. And this is, he was so turned off by not only the hospital, but the but by the American healthcare system that he said, you know, I just don't trust them. I'm gonna go elsewhere. I would I would never are you kidding me? Is it treat somebody some a situation like that at like a used car salesman? Like how desperate for revenue are you? Yeah. Pretty desperate because that's the like you said, it's a trickle down message from above. Like the revenue is what matters. Like we do good for people because we make a ton of money. So we can build more wings and get another yacht. Um, and if it's if it's you know that much better, maybe the market enables them to charge that much more. But there is, but is no it? difference in outcomes. And you talk about that in the book. Yeah, the Society of Thoracic Surgeons has an independent registry of heart surgery outcomes. And guess what? No association between price and quality, or price and charity care. Mm. Every place perceives that they're the best quality, and every place perceives they do more charity care than the next. Mm. And so, um, but good stuff is happening. We've got Sesame Care now, an online pricing platform. David Goldhill. Yeah, David Goldhill. Running. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So good stuff is happening. Yeah. So I mean, again, be, by sh like you said, you got to shine a light on it when you use, use sunlight, it disinfects, and then people go, wait, there's solutions here. Actually, since this is America, the solutions are often entrepreneurial, like what David is doing, um, like what ChenMed is doing. Mm. Uh, so ChenMed's interesting because if you're looking at solutions, it's like, well, we do all this unnecessary care. There's all this care variation. We don't develop relationships. We don't focus on those important things. I mean, what, what, what your team has been working on this for some time, like what, Tell me what the research your team has been doing, and then we can talk about ChenMed. Yeah, I don't know what to call the research our team is doing, but I love it. And I would say it's about the redesign of healthcare. And mm -hmm. there's no specialty for it, but it is, it's beautiful because it allows you to take a step back and ask, hey, maybe we should be treating more patients with diabetes with cooking classes than just throwing insulin at them. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can get people to a better place. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should talk about food as medicine. Maybe we should talk about low inflammatory foods as one of the treatments that we otherwise recommend for patients with certain conditions. Maybe we should just not talk about obesity in terms of, you know, what you should eat. Maybe we can talk about school lunches instead of just bariatric surgery. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can talk about access to medical care about in terms of how we can better use physician assistants and nurse practitioners and a team-based approach. Mm. These mm. are the things we're interested in. How can, you, how can we study cancer so it's not just about memorizing the chemo protocols, it's about understanding the environmental exposures that cause cancer, mm. something we haven't really studied. Mm. Loneliness, one of the greatest epidemics it predated COVID and it's magnified and it affects your physiologic reserves and it's rampant among seniors. ChenMed is creating communities. It's beautiful. This is the sort of stuff we're interested in. Social justice, addressing human rights issues by making medical arguments, not just political arguments. Mm. Talking about the cost of healthcare by talking about the appropriateness of care in every specialty, not mm. just one specialty. Rebuilding the public trust in hospitals by getting to honesty with pricing. These are the issues that we're passionate about. I don't know what you call it. Maybe it's healthcare 3.0 in the way that you talk about it. We call it the redesign of healthcare. A lot of 
old fashioned docs will tell you it's just great bedside medicine. It's just great medicine. That's I, everything you said is exactly what we've been banging on for all this time. It, 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 and that's where like the Chen Meds, the Iora Health, Iora was our partner at Turntable, full mm -hmm. disclosure, is this idea that, oh, wait, hold on. You can have team based care that focuses on prevention and relationship with patient that's technology enabled. So you have good tech that's a, not just a billing platform for your EHR. It's actually <laughs> like a freaking care device. Yeah. Get the patient involved in their care, put skin in the game, teach them how to cook, teach them how to shop for food in a supermarket in the periphery where the food is fresh instead of all that processed garbage in the center. Mm -hmm. Teach them basic nutrition. Teach yourself basic nutrition, mm -hmm. which we're not taught yeah. in medical school. Yeah. Never once talked about added sugar in, in medical Nothing. school. Nothing. It wasn't a thing, yeah. right? And and, uh, and and if we do that, then what happens is you actually bend the cost curve. You bend the happiness curve because patients feel heard and you feel like you're actually part of a calling instead of like clicking boxes, right? You know, we talk about the algorithm and the checklist and all that, all that's great. If you can actually treat the unique patient in front of you and prevent a case of diabetes, oh my gosh, like that's, a, it's, it's, it's amazing. And it takes time. Yeah. You cannot do it in 10 minute visits. Nope. I mean, this is what I love in, in your talk when I've heard you speak is you, you got to get off the treadmill, right? Because doctors and nurses and people in America who are billing are told that the way we, we're going to get better, the way we're going to get out of this hole in healthcare is you work harder. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's the solution. Mm -hmm. Work harder mm -hmm. and then we'll increase the billing and things will be better. Well, guess what? That's the wrong it's message. The wrong it's the wrong path. Yeah. Patients know it. You don't think patients come, they, they message me, my doc I, doc, I love you. This is the thing, they're projecting onto me their vision of the perfect doctor, someone who makes eye contact, <laughs> someone who spends more than five minutes talking about something with them, someone who uh, doesn't stare at the computer the whole time. Yeah. And they say, my doctor just seems stressed. They've got so many patients, yeah. they're running late, they're harried. I could tell they care, but they don't have time. And they've got all these notes and sometimes they'll let something slip. Like, man, I've got oh, my kids little league games today, but I don't know if I'm gonna make it. Yeah. That's insane. If you, if you could spend 30 minutes with a patient and then have a team around you that actualizes this, the rest of the care network together, like a health coach that can get in their head, that really gets into the emotion, the why of what's driving this patient, or uh, you know, a PA that can do the stuff that they really, they're so good at doing and they're so flexible at doing mm -hmm. in, as part of a team. And you huddle every day and you talk about patients that aren't coming in. Like, how am I gonna keep so-and-so out of, out, out, of out of the hospital? Yeah. Like, go text him. Let him know, see what's going on, see what he's eating, see, see if he's still stressed. If, it, and the loneliness thing means that we better as a society start looking at blue zones where people live to 100 on average. You know, they're just doing so much better. Why is it? Because they have a sense of community, a sense of connection, a sense of purpose. It's not just, oh, we have a pill to help you live to 100. There's no such thing. The pill is called love. <laughs> it's called community. <laughs> it's called connection. It's called purpose. Um, it's called walking. It's it's amazing. It's beautiful. Yeah. I I visited Chen Med and Iora and a bunch of these clinics, and I had the privilege of telling their story in this book, The Price We Pay. Oh, I love that that chapter is there. It was they were my they were near and dear to me, man. I loved being there. I mean, th there is no emoji to describe mm -hmm. how excited I was to be there. <laughs> yeah, they can't have invented it yet. I f I feel like I was I finally discovered medicine the way it was meant to be practiced. Mm -hmm. And it was this incredible experience. And actually, it was um, I went back to Chen Med. I did a lot of, of describing of uh, Iora, but Chen Med is just as wonderful, just as incredible of a vision. And I spent time there. And this clinic, by the way, it's not one clinic. It's like 60 clinics in like 20 states now. Mm. People are hungry for this stuff, for spending time with folks, to have their outcomes measured on a, on a population level, how mm. well these people are doing, how healthy they are, instead of just how much did you bill. Mm. The doctors and the nurses love it because they're off the billing treadmill. They're not on the hamster wheel. They are, can spend as much time as they need. They can send a car to pick you up or take you to a specialist visit. They can do whatever it takes to keep you healthy. They have classes on high blood pressure management and cooking and stress and yoga and whatever it takes to get you healthy it's like your turntable thing it's beautiful dude it and it's all story driven like this is the thing is like how, how do you quantify this well 
talk talk to people, <laughs> listen to their narrative, yeah. and watch what they what they experience. Yeah. Like, uh, oh, there's a uh, there was a patient at, at uh, one of the Iora clinics that was having really trouble. They would, was non compliant with dialysis, which, as you and I know, that's a that's not a great thing. Yeah. Uh, and would m- miss them, and just was miserable and depressed. Well, wh- what's going on? Well, I sit in dialysis. I have nothing to do. My family's not there. I'm alone for three hours. And I, I, and they were jumping out of their skin. They just couldn't take it. So the clinic huddled in the morning and said, well, what could we do for this person? Oh, you know, there's a hundred dollar iPod. We get a capitated rate to take care of a population. Mm-hmm. Let's spend some of that and get a little iPod and fill it with music and audiobooks and give it to this patient. Now, when they go, and this is a poor patient, it's not a patient who's affluent and can just go on, on, on bestbuy.com and get this thing. Gave it to the patient patient now looks forward to dialysis because it's their, their time to catch up on their books and their music and all yeah. of that. And, and it's simple stuff like yeah, that, yeah. you know? You know, this is the thing, in this, this is what, how you, d- 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 you you talk about the problems in the book, but who cares? We can talk about problems forever. And it's important to shine the line, and that's all great. This, this is the part of the book that matters. Let me see if I can get it to focus. Redesigning healthcare, redesigning healthcare. This, this is the part where then you get into bright spots. You know, you're talking about starting from scratch. You're talking about a real healthcare disruption, disruption, a healthcare blue book. Oh, if air ambulances give you these surprise bills for hundreds of thousands of dollars, well, here's a company that's fixing that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, here's what we can actually do. How do you buy health insurance in a transparent way? How do you deal with pharmacy hieroglyphics? You know, What's going on with equipment and our uh, fetish with technology? Does it actually help? Yeah. Are we over treating patients? Here's how we fix it. Yeah. Over wellness. That's a great chapter. <laughs> That's a great chapter. I mean, dude, what you've done here, I, I cannot, I, as someone who's been in this space now for a while, when I first read the book, I'm like, finally, <laughs> it's all in one thing. And we did that interview and actually the book did really well and it's changing the actual system. People are hungry for this. I think they're hungry for the redesign of healthcare. I'm not talking about the book. I'm talking about you come in pigeonholed and you're interested in a topic and you're given this diagnosis, treatment, diagnosis, treatment, pairing of everything. And it's frustrating because you know that you're not addressing the underlying causes that are bringing people to care. And you can, you're an expert, you're an authority, you, you're respected in the community, but you want to be out there and we cage you inside the building. <laughs> and it's true. like, you got to. How many, time, how many times has a colleague, have you gone to a colleague and gone, it's a really nice day and they're like, oh, I, I wouldn't know. Yeah. I've just been, I've been in here all day. <laughs> right. I could go to a patient's home. I could sit outside with a patient and do like Tai Chi. There's so, so many things you could do, right? If you actually empowered that as an engine of it. And I, I think it's going to, I mean, it's inevitable. It's the next emergent. It's just, but it needs a catalyst. And, you know, with um, with ChenMed, which is, I think, one of the great laboratories of healthcare where they've, they've totally redesigned healthcare. Look at what happened. They're value-based. In other words, they're paid on sort of a lump sum by mm-hmm. Medicare Advantage. So they don't have to bill for every little thing they do. Yep. Right? They're, they're which kinda... frees up a lot of bureaucracy. Yeah. You're not I, clicking boxes. Now, maybe some people like billing for every sing- single thing they do. Good for them. Good for you. Okay, God bless it them. It may work for dermatology. It may work for plastic surgery. Yeah. It doesn't may... work for primary care. Exactly. Yeah. It may work for radiology, but right. when you're talking about relationships, the hard part about chronic disease is not telling people what to do. It's helping them do it. Mm. They want a hand. Mm. And when you're able to enter into a relationship, work with a team, get them a navigator or a coach or somebody who can help with accountability get you out to the gym like a like a workout partner would get you out to the gym. It just provide some support and friendship. Guess what? Verta and other companies are showing you get much better outcomes. So here's what they did with this value-based model. COVID hits. They hear there's a virus in Italy and China that's about to come to the US that targets seniors. Mm. Okay, they've got all seniors, mm. right? Most of them are from minority groups and and have chronic diseases, mm. right? They go out into the sickest, poorest communities in America. Of elders. Yes. Yeah. They hear about this virus about to hit the US. They put their pickup vans that they use, they identified transportation as one of the big barriers to primary care and specialty care. So they pick people up, right? Then we'll take care of that, right? That's part, we just wanna get you to a great state of health. Mm. They have all these vans, they put them in reverse, said, Stay at home right now. Don't come in. We don't, we're trying to understand COVID. We're going to deliver your medications wow. and food. Wow. 
They wow. didn't have to wait for telemedicine nope. to be approved by CMS. They could turn it on overnight, Beca and they did. Because they're paid to do the right thing right. for the population they're caring for. You do well financially by doing good for patients, and when you align those incentives, every single other stupid money game falls away. Yeah, That's that's what we did at Iora, that's what they do at ChenMed, just get paid to do the right thing for patients. So what do the, the doctors get to do? The right thing for patients. And they which, love it. They love it. Now, they it's not like they don't work hard. No. They work really hard. They work very hard. But it's with a passion and a purpose that they felt was not even possible in the 30, 40 patient treadmill of primary care, where as a hospitalist then, I'm seeing all the failures of that. Like everybody's coming in and they're, it's just gonna be, a, it's gonna be a, a, a wheel, a hamster wheel, coming back in, discharge, no real change, not addressing root cause, still loneliness, isolation, despair, social determinants, completely unaddressed. And and then we wonder why we spend, you know, like 3.2 trillion and 20% of our GDP and get the worst outcomes in the developed world. Because we we're, just, we're doing it all backwards, but it, we know how to do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's amazing when you see it. And so we're basically seeing a generation reject the current healthcare system and build their own healthcare system. Yeah. And direct primary care. Direct yeah. primary care is a good example of that. They're yeah. following right after the lead of the IORAs and Chen Meds. Yeah. They're not doing Medicare Advantage. They're working with employers and working with individuals. And I know you and I, um, I think both spoke at the Hint Healthcare Conference. Yeah. All these people doing very creative ideas. Yeah. You can't do in this fee for service treadmill billing yeah. model system. Yeah. Yeah. And there's no reason like a you know the large integrated health systems can't do this. They can internally disrupt themselves. Like there's no reason that like a Geisinger or a Kaiser can't do this kind of care. In fact, there's every reason to, because all their skin is actually in the game because they're both the insurance product and the clinical arm. And that's cool when you have alignment like that. Yeah. So Ohio um, Ohio State Medical Center basically said, look, we're gonna give up on trying to do primary, primary care. Chen Med, you, you do it for us, you take over, you've nice. got the model down. Yeah. They've been playing catch up at these large centers. Yeah. That's right. right. Large organizations That's have right. trouble being agile. And it's the same with um, Iora. Large insurers partner with Iora and go, we, we need you to keep our Medicare Advantage population safe and healthy. And that way we all actually make money because with Medicare Advantage, you get a chunk of cash. Hey, don't spend it all in one place. Do the right thing. And by the way, if you if they're your patients are sicker, it's going to cost you more. So you, now you're aligned to actually keep them well, and then you get to keep some savings. Like mm -hmm. that's huge. Mm -hmm. And the patients have an experience that's like, it's, they're not being nickeled and dimed. It's like, you already know yeah. what, what you're paying for yeah. primary care. Yeah. It's like, oh, it's like a gym membership. It's like, or or less, like I just pay my insurance premium and it's covered. Yeah. No co-pays. Well, see, once you pull co-pays away from primary care, I understand the reason <laughs> of co-pays. It's to deny care. It's yeah. to prevent unnecessary care. But what if any contact with your primary care is a relationship building activity. Yeah. Well, then you kick the kick the copay away, and now you have a seamless relationship with your patient. So you see them when they're well, you see them when they're sick, you see them whenever they come in for a yoga class, they come in for a, a cooking class. That's what we used to do at uh, Turntable. What would it be like if you came to visit me in D.C. and I charged a copay? <laughs> I, I believe I believe you do sometimes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> no, we we eliminated copays in my house. Yeah. But yeah. it affects the relationship. I'm not gonna go. Yeah. I'm gonna be like, well, this guy's throwing up a barrier. Yeah, it's just yeah. gonna be a weird, it'll create some weirdness, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing with patients right, right. now. Right, right. You, you know, this is the problem. The money games are so entrenched. So when our, our insurance partner that would play ball with us, Nevada Health Co-op, because they were new and they didn't, you know, not for profit, and they were like, oh, we have some funding, let's do something unique. And then, okay, Turntable Health, great. We'll pay you a capitated flat fee you take care of these patients, keep them out of trouble, and you don't have to charge a copay. Mm -hmm. Okay, when they went under, our clinic, the only way our clinic would survive is to get another large partner like that because we didn't have enough, we needed enough patients to keep the lights on. This is what happened. I, you go to United Health. Hey, this is what we did with these guys. You wanna do the same thing? Oh yeah, sure. Except you gotta charge a copay because I mean, utilization. And also, we're only gonna give you X because you know, we don't pay that much for primary care. That's dumb. I mean, the going rate is $18 per month per patient. Right. And, and oh, and also, I mean, you could just supplement it by doing fee-for-service Botox or something, right? 
<laughs> and they literally told me this. Cool sculpting. Yeah, yeah, cool sculpting. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. I'm going to do some Reiki. I just throw some Reiki in there just for fun. <laughs> and we would do that. We would do that stuff. Like we would do yoga and acupuncture and things like that just because it was all just part of the thing if the patients benefited. And we do it in groups because mm -hmm. there's a group dynamic. Really, it's more, I mean, if the stuff is all placebo, great. If it works as a placebo and you're not lying to patients and giving them magical thinking, great. And they, they got something out of it because they were together. Mm -hmm. now, you know, the social isolation that's driving so much of this despair, mm -hmm. uh, you can alleviate it. Mm -hmm. Our waiting room was like a community freaking center. Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Yeah. Iora does a great job of that. And yeah. Chen Med too. They Chen tell too, you, yeah. you know, we want to see you. We yeah. want you to come in. Come in every month. Yeah, yeah. We love you. Love is one of their three values. That's awesome. Love, passion, and accountability. Nice. And it's everywhere. It's obvious. It's on the walls everywhere you go. It's beautiful. Mm. People feel love. They come in. They they're greeted by this front desk staff. They're, the doctors will come out between patients yeah. and just socialize with them yeah. if they're not there for an appointment. Yeah. They're creating communities. They learn together about chronic diseases, and they're winning. They're slashing healthcare costs, and people are happier with an NPF score of 90 plus. You don't see that in healthcare. Net, Typically, yep, yep. it's like 15. 15, yeah, our turntable score is like 90 plus. That means like net promoter score. Like how, how likely are you to recommend this clinic to family and friends? I mean, it's it's absurd. The, the, the average healthcare entity scores a 35%. Like that's that's like the best you'll get. Not even average, that's like, it's, you know, it just tells you what we're willing to compromise in this country. Yeah. Crappy care, and okay, here's the thing. So people will say, oh, as a doctor, as a nurse, I don't have time to do that kind of touchy feely squishy stuff. Like uh, I got stuff to do. What stuff? What's the stuff that you're doing? Let's <laughs> let's think about that. You're filling out a note so that the clinic can get paid. You're paying a biller yeah. who's totally unnecessary in a world where you don't bill like that. You know, you know, and, and all this stuff that you can strip away, it's a subtractive process <laughs> that allows you to actually just take care of another human being as a human being Imagine and feel that. that passion. And that's how that's how our staff was. You know? Imagine that. Yeah. In the plastic surgery board exams, they are asked, what is the billing code for certain procedures? Oh my God. It is part of the board examination. Wow, really? That's how far we've come, right? Wow. That's how pathetic the system is. This fee-for-service treadmill where we waste so much brain real estate on this useless nonsense create in a game that we manufactured that the AMA is promoting because they are oh, yeah. licensing fee on every CPT, CPT code. code. That's how they make their money. People That's don't right. realize that. You yeah. think you're gonna see an article in one of the big journals saying, hey, we need to just use plain English for our billings? <laughs> Not in JAMA. Not in JAMA. No. Yeah, because CPTs pay for all that. They pay for the huge building in downtown Chicago. A beautiful building. Where they're, yeah. yeah. And, then the, and then they're lobbying to resist any kind of change. And of course, doctors are on board because at least the doctors that are part of the AMA, the three of them that are still part of the AMA, because medical culture says this is how it's always been and this is how it can be. And another world is threatening to our sense of status and so on. Yeah. And we're getting nickeled and dimed by administrators. So we need this organization to push back. How about this? Make all that irrelevant reinvent healthcare the way you know it's supposed to be done yeah. and just get paid to do the right thing and everything just clicks. Yeah. It'll just, and here's the, here's the best part. Like people are, well, well, it sounds to me, Marty and Z-Dog, that um, the only answer for the, what ails us then is uh, since this is medical bankruptcy, it's a single payer because if we have single payer, then there's no more medical bankruptcies. Right, but what are you paying for? If you're paying for the same crap, the same garbage fee-for-service mill, is, is that gonna solve the problem? Do you think the Europeans have solved the problem? Have the Canadians solved that problem of care? No, it's just who's paying it. Yeah. Now we're all paying for right, it. Right, right. So, you know, you can have single payer, that's great, but pay for something that's good. Fix that first. I opened the book with this, um, the story of patients getting recruited for peripheral vascular stents at local churches in Washington, oh, D.C. that was heartbreaking, dude. And the point was, the point I started with that story, even though I don't think, no one's told me that's the best story in the book. Everyone loves chapter three and Carl Spad and some other parts. But oh, yeah. um, the reason I started with that story is that in the end, it shows it's all funded by Medicare. Yeah. All of those unnecessary, the millions and millions of dollars wasted in Washington, D.C. on unnecessary procedures. We're paying for it. We're paying for yeah. You think if you give Medicare to everybody, you've fixed healthcare? Mm -mm. No, you've you've cut out middlemen and you've cut some of the middlemen yeah. out and you've now empowered another problem. Yeah. 
And so let's not be fooled by the politicians that make it sound so easy. Like it's a, the problem is how we finance healthcare. No, we don't need to just talk about how we finance healthcare. We need to talk about how we fix it. Yeah. Two and, totally different things. And by the way, you're a professor of, you know, you're in the public health department, you're in the department of medicine as a surgeon, and you're in the business school. So you span all this world. And that's exactly right. You talk about payment, you talk about the care. And you know, when we were doing turntable, we were we were we were having to deal with both, right? Okay, we okay. So what's our payment model? Just pay us to do the right thing, a flat fee. Yeah. And let us handle that. Yeah. The rest. Yeah. That way we don't have to spend our time spinning wheels trying to please a bean counter. Uh, we just do the right thing. And then you can measure those outcomes that matter. Let's stop waiting for the government to fix healthcare. People hear that we're interested, me and my team interested in, my, my team and I are interested in the redesign of healthcare. And they think, oh, okay, is this single payer? Is this medi you know, lowering the medi Medicare eligibilities? No, no, we're not waiting for the government. We're talking about on the ground. We, doctors, nurses, changing the way that we deliver healthcare, suggesting new payment arrangements to the people we get paid from, but we fix it, not wait for other people Hello. to fix it. Amen, preach, preach, Marty McCary. <laughs> you and I are aligned on this. And this is not to say that, like you and I are like, well, no, we shouldn't have every person in this country getting good healthcare. No, that's exactly what we can do. We have to help build it. Actually, we have to drive it. We've been tricked into mm. thinking that healthcare is a, partisan issue where you either support yeah. one piece of legislation or reform or you don't. Yeah. And there the politicians are laughing at, at all of us in the country who are in this cat fight of do you support this or not support this? We saw it with the ACA, right? Yeah, the yeah, Obama, same thing. Are you for same thing. Obamacare? That's not going to save us. We're those they're talking about different ways to pay for healthcare, right. not how to fix how healthcare. How to fix it, right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tim Tim Shu is a medical student of mine. And he quickly got it. He was like, hey, I like this redesign of, of healthcare. Not macro, micro, micro, on the ground. Ground up. It's an emergent. See, our healthcare system is an emergent property of us. <laughs> it's, yeah. like, it's like you have all these people doing this care, and, it, and this is the macro system. If, it, if the emergent property comes from a culture that's defunct, that doesn't work in the 21st century, that's still cowboy thinking, that's still like doesn't believe in science, <laughs> like yeah. in, in methodology that improves care, that doesn't believe that the human relationship is primary, and that's driven by a fee-for-service incentive, what will emerge is a effed up kind of system that's then codified by government payments like Medicare, which yeah. by the way, people are like, the US has a free healthcare system. Medicare prices <laughs> yeah. are set by fiat, by a committee that's mostly run by specialists. Yeah. Price fixing. It's price fixing. It's the the communist party in Soviet Russia couldn't have fixed prices more efficiently than Medicare does because all the other insurance companies peg the price to that. That's not freedom. It's not a sustainable solution. Yeah. Um, Tim Shu is this, um, he was a medical student, graduated. This kid's a genius, okay? This kid's a true genius and Tim, Came up, joined our research team, which is half research, half advocacy, mm -hmm. right? Because we believe firmly, we're not writing stuff to present at a doctor's conference. <laughs> oh, isn't that interesting? Yeah. I'd like to show you my next 12 slides. Oh, yeah. Uh, please advance the slide, please. Right. Uh, <laughs> please advance the slide. <laughs> that's my favorite. They don't even have the tenacity to hold the damn clicker in their own hand. Next slide, please. <laughs> Get, control your slides, man. Anyway, sorry, Tim Shu. You, you've been traumatized by I PowerPoint have. also. I am a victim of an ace, an adverse conference experience. <laughs> <laughs> I wrote into my living will that if I'm in a vegetative state, they are supposed to play a PowerPoint presentation on the ceiling of the ICU <laughs> to knock me off because that will that will officially knock me That'll off. Be, that's like basically IV morphine at <laughs> intolerable dose. Oh that's, my God. High dose potassium. Oh, it is, man. It'll just stop your heart right away. Oh, oh God, out of boredom. Um, so, so Tim Shu. So Tim is a genius, true genius. He mm. joins my team. Every now and then he'll say something like, you know, I'll be talking, citing studies in our research meetings. And he'll say, you know, I'll say something like, according to this study in 2006, and he'll say, oh, Mark, uh, by the way, that was 2005, that study came out. <laughs> I'm like, Gunner. holy, mm -hmm. he's right, you mm -hmm. know? And, and, and he, the guy's a genius. 
And I, ta- I pulled him aside once and I was like, Tim, I saw your resume, pretty darn impressive. Vanderbilt, uh, magna cum laude. I don't even know what that means. I don't I, either, I took four but I saw it on the Jeffersons once. George Jefferson was like, I'm graduating magna cum lordi. <laughs> <laughs> Some distinction. I take it it's good. Um, then he decides to go to Oxford for two years after, med- after college before he starts Hopkins Medical School. Mm. And he gets a degree, a master's degree in advanced mathematics. Oh, just as a side project. Yeah, as a little yeah. side project. I'm like, Tim, people are taking like calculus six in high school, like AP. Why, just out of curiosity, not an insult, why did you decide to do advanced, a, a master's in advanced math before med school? And he says, I just wanted to bone up on my math. <laughs> So this is who we're dealing with here. He's a genius. The guy's a true genius. Um, So Tim does our our initial paper that sort of, um, you know, set off these these races of talks of price Uh gouging. Six years ago, seven years ago, on emergency room markups. That was the paper. Oh, right, right. And there's a lot of anger about it. You know, how dare, you know, this insurance companies are screwing us. Now this, you know, team is saying that there's markups. That's not our fault. The classic kind of finger pointing, you know, projection, projection, denial, denial. Anger, bargaining. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we're looking at a system that's broken, and we're saying, why is the price marked up twenty three times the Medicare allowable amount? That's not the the fair price, the Medicare price, but it's mm. it's the Wild West. Yeah, and so Tim goes down to the billing department, meets with a friend of mine, because he's trying to understand how does somebody figure out to mark it up 23 times. Is right. it deliberate? It's very precise. Is yeah. it software? It turns out they sort of program in the margin they need based on their payer collection rate uh, into a software program uh, and it jacks up the bills. Wow. Charge Master. It's like Charge Master Software Lite. Yeah. Yeah, there's the free version and the paid version. And Tim is like a programmer and this math genius and a genius in general. And he goes down and spends hours trying to understand this. And he basically tells me, Marty, I cannot interpret the bills. It's so confusing. And the way the markup is calculated is almost n- not understandable. Wow. This guy's a genius. Yeah. He can't figure it out. You know what's funny? I was wondering where all this genius talk was going because I was like, you know, Marty, if you like Tim so much, why don't you just marry him? Okay. <laughs> but now I realize why because you're painting a picture of a guy who's more than competent, the most competent person you can find to figure this out, and he can't figure it out. And this has been this has been told time and time again. It's a tale as old as time, a song as old as rhyme, Beauty and the Beast. I don't know where that came from in my head. But the thing is, it is an archetype that even the smartest humans cannot figure out where the hell these prices come yeah. from. Yeah. And and so how can Betty, who works at Walmart as a, as a greeter, ever have a hope of not getting sued and end up in court for a bill that made no sense to her, that she has no idea how to fight, for a uh, something that was never disclosed to her, that she had no opportunity or capacity to research because we don't give people the tools, the resources, and the autonomy to do that. That's that that's the moral heart of this book. Is like it's a it's really. We can't accept it morally, ethically, as humans, we can't. Like people talk about, well, how, how can you live in the US where you don't have a, a universal health care and all of this? Yeah, it's not a question of like what human rights are and all of this, it's a question of what kind of society do we want to build? And do we want a society where Betty goes bankrupt because uh, so, so we can pay half the CEO's salary? Healthcare in January, two years ago, became the largest business in the United States. Really? Dollars. Yeah, the largest industry in the United States. Let me ask, you, you told me this once. It's not that we spend 20% of our GDP on healthcare. It's more than that. Why is that? Yeah, next time you hear, that we, if we change the lexicon, we can fix healthcare just by engaging the public. And that's what I try to do with this book. It's a little bit of the health, the business of healthcare 101. Yeah. Like the big short was. Yeah. Instead of saying, oh, I didn't have to pay Medicare paid. No, we paid through our tax dollars. Instead of saying, I didn't have to pay my employer paid. Guess what? You're paying through wages. Through your wages and benefits pool. Yeah. yeah. If we can change the lexicon in healthcare to recognize that of all federal spending, 48% of it goes to healthcare in its many hidden forms. Let me show you how. Yeah, yeah. 25% goes to Medicare and Medicaid. Of all federal spending. Of all federal spending. Yeah. And then on on the uh, another big area is social security. It's like 24% of federal spending. Mm-hmm. A Kaiser study found that half of all social security checks are used for 
healthcare expenses, uh, uncovered uh, services, yeah, co-pays, and deductibles yeah. Yeah. among seniors. Yeah. Remember, half of people don't live like us. Half of Americans live paycheck to paycheck. You mean half people don't live on the street like me? I don't know how you're living, Marty McCary, <laughs> Mr. Topkins, surgeon. And by the way, it's great visiting you out here. Um, but when I get to the airport, why is it that the mayor has to announce that they are the mayor of that city? Oh, I love that. What is that? I'm Betsy Josh Evans, the mayor of Orlando. <laughs> Right. Welcome to our wonderful city. Yeah. While you're here, make sure to eat at Joe's, an amazing cafe that shows the vibrancy of the Orlando community. Yeah, I don't need to know. Did they do it in San Francisco too? They did it in SFO? Um, Cause I know we, we're dead inside. Like we don't, our mayor is just like, yeah, whatever, live here or don't. We're San Francisco, bitch. Like that, that's how our mayor is. But like these other cities, you land and you're on the tram going from the airport to the parking. And it's just like, Welcome to sunny Duluth, Minnesota, <laughs> home of the Duluth Pickles. It's like, oh, is it, was that the sports team? <laughs> it was in Atlanta, now that I come to think oh, of it. Oh, Atlanta, it was yeah. connecting in Atlanta. I remember Atlanta. Atlanta's airport is so big that you're going to be uh, assaulted by that for like hours. <laughs> in Orlando, they have that that tr tram, tram yeah. that takes you like 50 yards. You have to like wait. Oh, 15 minutes to take this train to go 50 yards. You're basically crossing an <laughs> alligator infested swamp. That's it. Like it's like, and, and of course you're on the thing with like tons of little kids that are like all grumpy. Like, oh, Disneyland, oh, it's Disney World, honey. Shut up, mom. You don't know me. And and it, it's, I find it to be a despair filled short ride, like, <laughs> like an anti Disney ride, you know, like it's a miserable world after all. See, I like studying the TSA because it's kind of a, a symbol of our reactionary healthcare system. How so? You know, it's like <clears throat> somebody forgets to take off their belt <laughs> and they hold up the whole line and the TSA agent walks out to everyone in the line and yells at the collective group, you know, you remember to take off your belts when you come through. <laughs> It's like, like guilt by association. Yeah, there's right. no statistical association between that individual and me and the probability of a, someone in line doing the same error. Oh my gosh. This is like a logical fallacy. The TSA is, is founded on logical fallacy. They're like a misinformation <laughs> factory. Like next thing you know, they're gonna be cherry picking data to support their very existence. You see, we've stopped at least 30% of all terrorist attacks. <laughs> yeah, by putting them in a CT scanner to check out their kidney cyst. <laughs> It's like, what is that? Yeah. Oh, and then and then biopsy it because we're not sure it's a cyst. <laughs> right. So you know, I don't know. Every time I come through that TSA scanner, I call it the CT scanner. Oh, boy. I ask them, "What's the size of my renal cyst today?" Oh, and, and they look at you blankly. Yeah, they don't. Yeah, they don't yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Know. I tell them, invite them to the pancreas club, and maybe they'll they'll understand. <laughs> You pancreas surgeons and your cysts. I don't understand it. No, it's it's a fun meeting, the pancreas club. I'd say it's a lot more fun than the spleen meeting. Those guys, first of all, they're still trying to decide if they're vestigial or not. They're such pansies. They really are. Yeah. Like someone nicks them, suddenly they get really angry. Yeah, right? They're suddenly they're a thing. <laughs> <laughs> tell them they're unnecessary. Oh yeah. I'm sorry, you're not necessary. Oh, tell that to the pneumovax you have to take when I when I leave, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh, I'm sorry, I encapsulated sepsis. I guess there's that, you know. I almost forgot there was a pandemic. I know, right? Yeah. Because it's you know awesome. what? You know, it is great. Dude, I, I tell you, this is um and that part of your book where you talk about post pandemic and mm. pandemic is really powerful. Dude, I'm excited that people are gonna buy okay, listen, I gotta give them a call to action here. This is really important. This thing's out in paperback. You can get it on Amazon. I'm gonna put a link. It's important that you buy the paperback. Okay. And the reason is we bump this by you guys reading it, you're activated soldiers in an army of change. Number next, it bumps it to New York Times bestseller list. It's now in every airport, everywhere that you can imagine. Everyone's buying it, people are reading it. Rank and file grandmas are now like, I remember reading in Marty's book. That guy, first of all, he's very handsome. Second of all, he's just brown enough to get a cavity search at the TSA. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the feedback from your dad. Totally, yeah, totally. Oh, my dad's always telling me, he's like, maybe you should grow your hair back. You look a little terrorist-ish. <laughs> I'm like, why is it bald? I've never seen a bald terrorist. You watch too much TV. Triple X was not a documentary. All right? <laughs> Vin Diesel is not real. Um, but you guys buy, buy, buy the book, read the book, live the book, be a part of this movement for change. Only we can do it as clinicians. Like you said, we have the trust, the credibility, the training, and the actual drive to escape the moral injury prison that we've allowed to be built around ourselves. 
Well, the, the book represents the research of a lot of people, a lot of doctors and nurses, students on my team over many years. So thanks for the privilege of being able to talk about it today. I would have thought it was all just this one genius named Tim who thinks he's so smart. He takes advanced math before med school. For he's fun. in there. He's in the book for oh, sure. Oh, that's yeah. right. All right. Well, great. Well, Dave, Marty, this is a joy, dude. And uh, you know what we'll do? Let's do some uh, Let's do some other stuff on other things while we're here. And uh, I just, I'm really honored actually, truly to Nexus. It's weird that like attracts like, like you're doing this work and I wanna also redesign healthcare and be mm -hmm. the catalyst for communicating that. And so you and I together, we're like peanut butter and chocolate with a little weird caramel that's not right thrown in just for good measure. <laughs> 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 now keep up the great work, man. I love, I, you know, I go back and watch some of your videos just to cheer me up sometimes because you're talking about this vision for Healthcare 3.0. It's inspiring. My students are really inspired by you and they don't watch you because they know we're friends. They've watched you beforehand. And I, you're helping a lot of folks out there trying to make sense of this broken system I, and giving us hope. So thanks thanks for being a voice for all of us. I appreciate that. And of course, um, Tim is not included in this because he's too good to watch Z Dog videos. <laughs> Guys, I love you. Marty McCary, the price we pay out on paperback. Now order it today and we are out. Peace. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>